Good morning, good morning. It's me, Kenny Polkari, your host of the party. And today is Thursday, March 16th, 2023. And what is it that you need to know after we had another kind of panicky day yesterday? Well, guess what? The Swiss National Bank steps up and comes to the rescue. Credit Swiss is saved. European markets this morning are all higher as a result. U.S. futures, though, remain under a little bit of pressure. First Republic bonds were now downgraded to junk, and so the company is now forced to consider their options. And what do we have for dinner today? We're going to have the cauliflower risotto with truffle butter. It's a really, really delicious dish. Okay, so this is like breaking news if you're just waking up to the sunshine and the new day. The Swiss National Bank steps up and saves Credit Suisse offering a $54 billion basically line of credit. And I gotta ask, did anyone really expect anything else? I mean, come on, it's, it's Switzerland. They're the Swiss and Credit Suisse is a national treasure. The Swiss were never going to let Credit Suisse go down the drain. And as expected, it is gaining 30% uh, 30 today uh, in trading this morning. And, and the European banking sector, well, that got smashed yesterday, and that is also rebounding. Markets across Europe are all higher, up better than a buy, about 1%, with Italy in the lead up one one and a quarter percent. Because remember, they also took a pound of flesh out of the Italian banks yesterday. Now... Stocks and bonds had a wild day, right? As fear rises, stocks fall, and bond prices rise, leaving many to ask, what is going on? Larry Fink, BlackRock CEO, puts out his annual letter yesterday, and let's just say it wasn't bullish. At 4 p.m., the Dow was off by 280 points, or 9 tenths of a percent. The S&P down 28, or 7 tenths. The NASDAQ, though, rose by 6 points on the assumption that the Fed is going to pause, the Russell lost 31 points, or 1.7%, and the transports gave back 135 points, or 1%. Bond yields plunged. The two-year now yielding 4%. The five-year now yielding 3.6%. The 10-year yielding 3.49%. Recall that last week, these same bonds were yielding 5.2%, 4.9%, and 4.25%, respectively. The swift price rise in bonds, as well as the surge in gold, which traded from 1890 to 1942, was a move to safety as investors panicked over what some are thinking is this global banking crisis, right? So fear swept across the globe. Confidence in the banking system is now challenged. The crisis that began out in California one week ago has now spun a web enveloping regional banks, super regional banks, Money center banks, Swiss banks, Italian banks, French banks. You know who we didn't hear from? Greece. Do you remember what it was all about the Greek banks back in 2010? Greek was, Greece was at the center of the drama. How great would it be right now if this was just about the Greek banks? But alas, it is not. This is now about so many more banks. Look, it's really all about the fear that's been created in the global financial banking system and how uh, fast that can spin out of control. And we all know what happens when everyone piles on, running for the exits at the same time. The technology allowing for swift executions and equities allows for cancellations of bids and offers in a picosecond, leaving voids in inline demand while raising supply at any price. And that is true in the stock market, but now it's also beginning to be true in the bond market. Uh, in this case, it would be the swift execution of buy orders, leaving a void in inline supply, causing a surge in prices that sends yields plunging. And by now you understand what it means. It means chaos, confusion, and a bit of panic. And it means rising levels of fear, uh, falling prices in stocks, rising prices in bonds, which sends yields falling, right? Causing more Panic. So the panic breeds panic, breeds more panic. Just to be clear, do you know what a picosecond is, by the way? It's one trillionth of a second. Yes. And that's the measure by which algos and technology expect the system to work because they convince everybody that speed is so much more important than execution. And all the speed does is allow, uh, allow them to get into and out of positions faster than in the blink of the eye. That is until everyone is trying to do the same thing. And it gets a little bit dicey and clogged and panicky, which is what uh, we've been seeing over the last couple of days. Now, let's be clear. This is not 2008. This is not a global financial meltdown. This is not 
about the collapse or failure of banks, insurance companies, brokers, real estate, etc. No, 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 no. This is about the fear created by the collapse of one bank uh, that forced the Fed, the Treasury, and the FDIC to backstop all the depositors, right? Unlimited protection or risk watching a run on almost every regional mid-sized bank in the country. Money center banks, which were never really in trouble, also came under pressure as the fear spread. But guess what? Do I smell opportunity in the big money center banks and even some of the regional, super regional banks? I mean, come on. Recall, the panic was ignited by a bunch of venture capitalists who, uh, who are managed by the, who are paid, by the way, to manage risk, who all shit themselves and, and, and created a run on the bank when they realized that the risk controls uh, at this one bank were anything but appropriate. But here's the key. This was their bank. Let's not forget that. Compounded by the fact that a bunch of people known as the bankers apparently had no clue on how to manage uh, risk in the fixed income market. But they did have an A rating for their ESG efforts, so that's good. Uh, and that was compounded by California regulators, think the San Francisco Fed, that apparently was unaware of the mismatch of risk at this said bank. And this was all compounded by an administration that spent money like, like it was going out of style, paying people to stay home versus getting a job, compounded by years and years of easy money overstimulation and a failure to recognize the birth of an inflationary cycle uh, when it hit, causing what's, what some way, what, causing what some say was a swift rise in interest rates, causing inexperienced risk managers and fixed income people to completely miss the mark on how to manage the risk of rising rates in an inflationary cycle at a bank that served one type of client, and that is the key here as well. Silicon Valley Bank serviced one type of client, so their risk was clearly defined, yet their risk controls, not so much. I think I've wondered this many, many, uh, many, many times in my notes over the past year, saying I was afraid of a repeat of the late 70s, early 80s, Many called me a dinosaur. Can you believe that? I, I just, I, I laugh about that. So I have just one thing to say about the rising rates swiftly comment. It's hard for me to understand how anybody can say that the Fed raised rates swiftly. They began announcing this move in the summer of 2021 after inflation kicked in, but before uh, they ceased stimulating, right? Then they started to raise rates in January of 22, 25 base points to start, when they should have probably raised them by 100 basis points right out of the gate. And then they pushed them higher at every meeting, spending plenty of time making sure that everybody knew as they watched inflation go from 1.4% to more than 9% by the summer of 2022. They were very clear about what they were doing. They made it clear that the churn rate was going to at least 5% and they gave plenty of time for risk managers to make appropriate decisions. They spent plenty of time holding their hands. They didn't, this didn't happen overnight by any stretch. So the rising swiftly argument just doesn't work for me. This is about stupid and I guess you just can't fix stupid. As a result of the SBVB drama though, First Republic Bank is the next bank to face the music. Now set, now set to consider what their choices are after their bonds were reclassified as junk, sending that stock once again spinning out of control. Headlines this morning suggest that First Republic is weighing all options, including a sale. First Republic, which was not in the same space, uh, did come under pressure when those same VCs started telling portfolio companies and anyone else that would listen to take their money out of that bank as well. Pictures of people lining up at the branches all around the country over the weekend sealed the fate because they succeeded in destroying confidence. Again, causing a round of panic in the U.S. banking industry. I think the problem here is that the VCs, all of them, you know, they shit themselves the minute it gets hot in the kitchen, stamping their feet and then creating hysteria where there wasn't any, or at least wasn't any until they created it. In any event, I've heard from many clients over the last couple of days, right, over the past week, whatever, people clearly concerned about what's happening. Many asking if they should take their money out of the bank or how do they protect themselves, right? Taking your money out of your bank is not the answer here, right? First, because you're now completely protected. After what the Fed did last week, everybody is protected, right? But maybe spreading money between a couple of banks might make you feel better if you happen to have a lot of it. 
One being a money center bank for sure, if you're that nervous, right? Putting excess cash into short duration treasures like three months or six months would be another option because those are completely protected. But in the end, the answer is don't panic. Talk to your advisor, make sure you understand what's going on um, versus the chatter, right? Remember, this is not a 2007, eight, nine Bear Stearns Lehman moment at all. Absolutely not. Then, you know, they ask, what's the Fed gonna do now, right? I say they should raise rates by 25 basis points. They should stick to that narrative that they've been telling everyone. A failure to raise rates now would send the message that the system can't handle it or that the Fed uh, is, is, is fearful. Something that I think would be a mistake. But the odds are now 50-50 over do nothing or make a move. And traders are now betting that interest rates are going to be one full percentage point lower by Christmas. Oh, boy. What am I missing? Okay, we're now in the quiet period. The Fed is in lockdown ahead of next week, so don't expect to hear anything from JJ. You may, though, hear from Goldman, who acts as the Fed's mouthpiece when the Fed can't talk, and they say that the Fed, they say that the Fed will do nothing next week. So let's see, the bets are on, right? In any event, the crisis does create a conundrum for JJ and the Fed. Because they have to consider the fight to kill inflation, but they also need to maintain financial stability. So the question is, will a 25 basis point move cause more instability or not? Eco data today includes the usual suspects, initial jobless claims, and continuing claims. But it also includes housing starts expected to be up one-tenth of a percent and building permits up three-tenths. The Philly Fed is expected to show a decline of 15 versus last month's decline of 24.3. And remember, the Empire State Manufacturing survey was, was horrendous. Now, this morning, U.S. futures are down. Dow was down 50, S&P is down 5, NASDAQ was up 22, and the Russell was down 5. Expect the action to continue to revolve around the banking question. The move by the Swiss is halting the panic there, but you can still feel the nervousness in the markets as a result of the coming Fed and ECB decisions, along with what's going on in, in the First Republic. How are they going to solve that? European markets, though, are higher after the uh, Swiss news, right? Up about a half a percent to one percent. The Credit Swiss drama is top of mind, while the ECB president, Christine Lagarde, is due to make her policy announcement at any moment. She's expected to raise rates by 50 basis points. She's been very clear about that. But the question now is, will she cave? Will she pause? Well, we're about to find out. Oil crashed yesterday, right? Falling 4.3% or $3.10 a barrel to end the day at 67.60, even something I didn't see as the panic swept the globe. Chaos in the stock and bond market suggesting that a global recession is coming and that's going to kill demand. And then you got Larry Fink telling everybody, oh, it's ugly. Add in the new supply that Joey has authorized, right? New supply in oil and boom, down we go. This morning, oil is trading up 50 cents at 68.10. I'm sure we're going to hear the Saudis chime in at any moment. The S&P closed yesterday at 38.91, down 28 points, after testing as low as 38.38 earlier in the day. Futures suggesting a lower open, but not a route. I still think we could and will test 3,800 once again. Recall that Monday sell-off took us right down to 3,800. We tested it. We held I expect that it's going to test a couple more times to see if it holds. If we fail to hold at 3,800, then you know what I think happens. It opens the door to test the October lows of 3,600 uh, after that. So stay awake. Prepare yourself for more volatility. Remember that the chaos creates opportunity. Stick with the quality, as if you needed me to tell you that. Put money into short-duration treasuries. If you're really, really nervous, make sure you uh, do your homework, know what you own and why you own it, and then allocate capital accordingly. Look, there are some great opportunities. Stocks have been really dislocated. Good quality names have been really dislocated. So keep your eyes open. Okay, what do we have for dinner time? We're having the cauliflower risotto with truffle butter. It's another great risotto dish. It's easy to make and it's easy to present and it looks beautiful and it tastes delicious and your, your guests are going to be so happy with you. So for this, you need diced Spanish onion, olive oil, butter, two cups of arborio rice, one uh, half cup of dry white wine, you know, Pinot Grigio, Santa Margarita. You need cauliflower florets cut into bite-sized pieces. You need warm chicken broth, salt and pepper, truffle oil, or truffle butter, one or the other. Uh, and naturally, you need the shaved Parmigiana cheese. Now, 
You want to heat the oil and butter in a heavy saucepan over medium heat. Then you're going to add the onions. You're going to cook those maybe 10 minutes. You know, you want to get them nice and soft and translucent. Then add the risotto, the rice. First, let it brown. Stir it. Coat it well in that oil-butter mixture with the onions. Uh, after about 10 minutes and you've done that, add the wine and continue to cook until the wine is almost completely absorbed. Next, begin by adding one ladle of the hot chicken broth, stirring frequently like you do when you make risotto until it's almost completely absorbed. And then you add another ladle, you do the same thing, and you repeat that process until you've used all the chicken broth and the risotto um, is done, right? And you know it's done when, when there's just a little bit of a bite left to it. Don't make it mushy. Now, while the risotto is cooking, you want to heat some more olive oil in a frying pan and you're going to add all cauliflower florets. You're going to cook those over medium-low heat, adding a tablespoon or two of the broth, also the chicken broth, until the cauliflower is tender and just beginning to turn a golden brown. Then you're going to remove it from the heat. After cooking the risotto, uh, you want, and the, and the rice should be tender to the bite, maybe it's about 30 minutes, you're going to stir in the cauliflower and butter, and you're going to season with salt and pepper to taste. Go easy on the salt because of the chicken broth. Once it's well mixed, you're going to serve the risotto in individual bowls, drizzling the top with a little bit of truffle oil or a spoonful of truffle butter. You want to garnish this with the shaved Parmigiana cheese um, and serve it immediately, right? Because you want it to be really nice and warm uh, when they eat it and creamy and delicious in any event. Look, look at me. I'm all dressed up today because I'm going to moderate a panel at this uh, private wealth conference over here at PGA. So I will be uh, off the grid here for at least a couple of hours this morning, and then I will be back. But until then, take good care.